Okay, so I have the uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Tony Kovsek, who wouldn't need my introduction, though I'll uh, read a few lines about him. Tony is a Klein and Carlton Beale Professor of Energy Resources Engineering in the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences at Stanford University. The school name will soon change to School of Sustainability. Um, currently, he directs the Center for Mechanistic Control of Unconventional Formations, a DOE-funded Energy Frontier Research Center, the Stanford Center for Carbon Storage, and also the SUPRI A, Stanford University Petroleum Research Institute A program on subsurface energy for sustainability. Tony and his research group develop and apply advanced imaging techniques, experimentation, and models to understand complex multiphase flow of gas, water, and organic phases in natural and manufactured porous media with applications in carbon storage, energy storage, and increased utilization of carbon dioxide for subsurface applications. Such research, such research has resulted in roughly 200 peer-reviewed publications and two textbooks. He has been honored with the John Franklin Carr Award for Distinguished Achievement in Engineering from the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE, and also the School of Earth Sciences Award for Excellence in Teaching. Thanks very much, Tony, to accepting our invitation. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. Well, perfect. It just appeared. All right, so uh, my goal is to keep Mark awake, and so I will do my best to do that. Um, so my, I, I was asked to talk about uh, seals, cap rocks, so I will, I, I'm going to do that. I want to motivate this. Uh, basically by telling you why I'm interested in, in hydrogen. So on the, you know, the upper left here, there's uh, some data that is kind of interesting to think about. So California has been building uh, a lot of solar. So solar is the top line that you see there. The bottom line is, is wind. And so this is curtailed electricity. So this is electricity uh, that is producible, uh, but it ha basically it finds no home. So either it finds no home because nobody wants to buy it because there's so much electricity, or it can't actually, you know, the grid cannot connect who's generating it with who uh, would like to consume it. So what you see is that this number is going up sort of year over year, and it's non-linear, right? So it's increasing greater than, greater than linear. And so the, the number here is, is pretty staggering. So it's, uh, in 2021, it's one and a half terawatts of electricity uh, that basically, f again, found no home. Uh, and so this is a huge waste of space because solar energy is the greatest land hog of all energy sources, um, right? You think about it, it's 1,000 watts per meter squared is the energy density. Uh, so there's a lot of California that's covered with, with a uh, solar panel that's not being, uh, you know, not being used productively. So what could you do with this uh, at a relatively, you know, uh, optimistic conversion efficiency? Uh, this is like 30 million kilograms of hydrogen uh, every year. Um, there's no way that we're going to store them in these high-capacity tanks that you see here because that's something like 7 million high-capacity tanks. So the other part of this story is even though that there is so much uh, electricity in California, uh, when we need it, it's not there. So the state has had an increasing number of what's referred to as flex alerts. That's basically when they do the look-ahead forecast and they say we're not going to be able to get enough electricity in the state. Uh, if everything kind of happens. So what they do is they, they ask people, they pay people to not consume electricity, and then if that still doesn't work, they, you know, they, uh, they basically turn off the electricity to, to certain people. And then you know, your number always comes up on that. So you know, that's, the, that's the energy storage kind of uh, issue. And uh, you know, we heard a lot of talk about salt formations. So the, there are no salt formations in California. There are none on the West Coast that I know about. The closest ones that I know about are in Utah. That's like about, oh, I, if I get it right, it's about 1,200 kilometers from, from California. That's a long, it's a long way. 
Um, so what we do have are a lot of porous formations. So an example is this Rio Vista field, which is near Sacramento, California, so in the middle of the state. It's produced something like four trillion cubic feet of natural gas so far. Uh, so the capacity there is like eight billion kilograms of hydrogen, right? So this is a big field. There's a lot of storage that could go in there. So the other part of this story, uh, you know, or, or where I'm kind of going with this, is you know a lot of people really think about you know this this picture here, right? So what's going to happen? to fluids in basically a, a sandstone, right? And most everybody assumes that the cap rock is a black box, right? So it's a seal, it's gonna work. You know, this field had natural gas in it before, that was a buoyant fluid. You know, they're gonna, you know, it's gonna hold, it's gonna hold hydrogen. Um, so I, I don't know what Mark's gonna talk about, but I get, I, he might talk about, you know, production-induced uh, changes, um, but, you know, generally, we've done a lot of work trying to understand what, you know, these cap rocks really look like. So at this scale, so here's a bar, 250 microns, this looks like a solid piece of rock. You know, you look at this at a smaller scale, and, you know, it's a porous medium. Uh, it has pores in it, it has fractures. Uh, fluids do flow through these things. Um, I, I will say... Uh, a lot of, you know, companies will tell you, you know, what they think the permeability is of cap rock, uh, and they never seems low enough to me uh, to prevent uh, to prevent leaks. So, uh, you know, we've actually have heard a lot about this lately. So this is in the porous medium part. This is a way that you know we sort of look at it. So this scale here is on the y-axis here is these are capillary forces, right? These are gravity forces. Uh, and then this is uh, viscous or mobility ratio. So what's pretty interesting is we understand these flows and porous media pretty well. Um, you know, methane storage is really right here at the very, in that very narrow strip. Uh, and hydrogen also doesn't overlap with with that either. So in terms of understanding things actually in the sandstone, maybe there are some things to look at. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that um, and, and kind of dwell, dwell on these questions. So, um, you know, the best analog probably for hydrogen storage really is natural gas storage. I'm going to show you a lot of work we've done in context of, of CO2. So what are the things that can really matter here, right? The water saturation, uh, what is the, you know, what does the seal actually look like? Uh, is there going to be slip? And we don't understand all of those things above, but what we do know is that seals are multi-scale and multi-physics, right? So uh, what scale you look at them, there are different <laughs> physics you need to worry about. Uh, we also know that they're very reactive. Um, there's a lot of surface area. You put in something that's not equilibrated, they're, they're going to react. All right, so this is kind of the outline of what I'm going to want to do. Uh, I kind of think that the, the laser pointer here is working better, right? So I'm going to talk a little about saturation. I'm uh, going to talk about rock fabric. Uh, and then probably I'm going to be out of time. Uh, but I'll do a little bit on diffusivity and, and, uh, and show you some, some, other, some other things. And I will try and keep track of my time as I go. So um, one of the... I think interesting things to think about, again, you know, seals are black boxes, everybody always assumes that they're impermeable, um, you know, and that they're fully water saturated, or that if they aren't fully water saturated, that somehow the part that isn't water saturated isn't very conductive. So I'll show you uh, an experiment, then I'm going to show you a cartoon drawn with equations. Uh, so this is a, a you know, a, a shale material, uh, and you're looking at basically two different views through it, two different slices through it. It's an X-ray CT image. Uh, the darker colors are less dense, and you can basically assume less dense means more permeable. And you're looking at, oh, this is interesting. So this, is, this exclamation pointer is time, so somehow the, fault, the font hasn't translated. At least you see the times here. And again, on the top, you're looking at, you know, uh, 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 basically a horizontal plane on the bottom, you're looking at a vertical plane. Fluid is injected 
from uh, the right-hand side um, because in CT scanning, that's always where your, your uh, fluids end up being injected because of the way that it works, right? So we're going increasing time. Uh, this scale here is the change in the CT number. So as it's getting sort of more red, that's more fluid. Uh, and this is also proportional to the amount of water that's been, uh, that's been put in there. So what you basically see is that this material that starts off dry uh, will take in water. Uh, it actually goes through a, uh, what we call a mixed imbibition process. So there's forced water flow and there is spontaneous water uptake into the tighter parts of the matrix. And what's sort of important for the conversation here uh, is that the best that we can do, uh, it's still only about half full of water. So it's half full of gas at the end of you know, our attempts to try and get it uh, pretty fully saturated, right? So um, the partially saturated conditions really have implications for diffusion through the cap rack, right? Because we saw uh, uh, Marco had a nice set of numbers there, right? That basically diffusion through the gas phase is four times faster, right? Than diffusion through the liquid phase. So that's one, you know, one thing to think about in terms of saturation. Uh, here's another one. So this, again, this is, this, this is a cartoon drawn with equations. So, uh, you know, take it as a cartoon, not as a, you know, a, a true calculation calculation results. So on the top, it's kind of a scenario that we've been playing with. We've been thinking about uh, uh, hydrogen storage and how to simulate it and comparing simulators. So it's uh, hydrogen injection into a depleted gas reservoir. So blue, the dark blue is methane. The lighter blue is the aquifer below, okay? And on the bottom, you can kind of see, you know, some general sort of lengths, right? So depleted gas reservoir, maybe 20 meters thick, and again, just ran not randomly, but choosing a 100 meter thick uh, uh, cap rock, right? So uh, there is permeability in both of those, right? So um, 10 to the minus 18th, I didn't put my you know, units, but meters squared, right? So that's a nano Darcy permeability, okay? So it's not a zero permeability, it's nano Darcy. Again, kind of what you'd think a good cap rock would be. We can compute gravity capillary equilibrium here. And, uh, you know, against a depleted gas reservoir, so that's what would happen. If we developed an aquifer, we would also, as we put gas up against the cap rock, we'd also expect uh, that we'd start to establish, uh, you know, capillary equilibrium with the, the you know, the permeable uh, cap rock as well, right? And we dewater the dewater the shale. So um, it, it is sort of generally applicable, this idea, right? So anyways, we can compute the um, capillary pressure from the basically the gas water contact, uh, assuming, well, that's a pretty reasonable difference in density uh, for most, you know, hydrogen storage conditions. Uh, a lever J function, going to assume it's the same for both porous media. I know that's not correct, but anyways, again, it's a cartoon. And you end up with this picture on the, on the right here, okay? So, you know, basically it's saying, right, that we have complete water saturation in the reservoir at the gas water contact, right? It's permeable, so it desaturates quite a bit. The rock holds on to some water. Uh, but then when we get to the cap rock, the saturation again increases, but there is some you know, on the far right there, that is the gas saturation, right? So, uh, you know, basic sort of petroleum engineering, it's, it's saying, you know, that there should be gas in the cap rock. Um, and that's interesting to think about. So having said that, I'm gonna show you a lot of images of gas in shales, because that's, again, is one of our sort of motivating factors. So one of the things that my group has worked on for some time is what we refer to as top-down imaging. So a lot of people will go into nanoporous material, just take a sample, right, and then look at the structure of the rock, and then they extrapolate that somehow it's important. Um, we do that as well, but we actually start from the core. So on the upper left here is uh, uh, an image of a core, so that actually is uh, one inch diameter. 
about two and a half inches long. It's been saturated with a penetrant, okay? So uh, it's actually CO2 in this case. So the redder the color, that means the more CO2 that's, that's in that, okay? And these are sensitive to the effect of stress, right? So you can increase the effect of stress and you can look at where the gases go. We can look at this in a transient sense and see transiently where they flow. So we have this 3D image of the rock, so we can you know, slice it, dice it, do whatever we want with it. We can look at a cross-section like you see in the middle here, okay? And this is an interesting region because it has you know, spaces that are 100% devoid of CO2, so there's no CO2 in there, and other regions like this small square that are, are very saturated with CO2, right? So uh, again, you know, most people's picture of a cap rock is it's some uniform material, right? It's fine-grained, it's full of water, it's got zero porosity, you know, all these things, and don't, it doesn't really kind of work that way. So, uh, this is just an example. So what we would do, we would say, here's some really interesting area. Uh, we would actually destroy the sample by going in and cutting it out. We haven't figured out how to avoid doing this. Cut out uh, a cross-section, um, polish it, and then put it under an SEM, okay? And so this is a full diameter mosaic. This is truly a multi-scale image. So you can look at that box part. You can zoom in and see this image. So that's pixel size is about 400 nanometers. Zoom in 74 nanometers uh, and see a little bit more. I'll talk about the TEM image kind of, well, then, then you know, again, we'd say we've got some interesting area that we might use a different tool, transmission electron microscope, to actually uh, get even smaller. So on that image on the right, we'll see this again a couple times, the dark parts are actually nano-sized pores. All right, so we're imaging the nano-sized pores. Um, and what we can sort of do with this is, is kind of the topic of the next slide. Um, so, you know, what penetrant you use. Uh, CO2, in addition to being, like, interesting, is actually a great penetrant because it tends to, you know, it goes into pore space and it absorbs the stuff. So you get a really nice picture. Uh, this is the same cross-section, one saturated with krypton, which doesn't really absorb and with CO2, which does absorb very well, and we can see, uh, you know, we can, we can see where the, you know, where the gas has gone. So there are sort of these linear features. So this is not under confinement, right? This is just sitting there. Uh, in the SEM image, the uh, CT image actually is confined, but we see these linear features, fractures, right? And then we see other regions like, you know, these regions down here that, again, carry uh, a lot of CO2. So we can kind of, so this is, again, that same cross-section. We'll look at two different areas, one and two. Um, we think we understand how the gas moves through it. It's kind of interesting to ask the question, why are these, there are these inaccessible regions? So you can see they're sort of blue. Uh, and it has really, relates to the fabric or the, the texture of the rock. So in these regions that are um, basically impermeable to gas, you find you know, things like pyrite, barite, really dense minerals. And they're basically, they've either deposited or they're basically forming sort of like a shield around that area of the pore space, you know, preventing, uh, preventing gas from coming in. Um, so we we've actually have a whole library of these kinds of you know, pictures of rock fabric and we can associate with them, you know, what is permeable and what is impermeable. And maybe I should go back and kind of say, you know, these are, these are permeable regions. And what you sort of see texture-wise uh, is, is basically, you know, you see open pore space. The dark stuff here is actually organic matter. Uh, and here's an example, right, of a, of a pyrite framboid. It's actually got permeable material in it, but, you know, nothing could ever kind of reach it because it's, it's so dense and impermeable. So, you know, what we sort of learn about shale fabric and gas, you know, distribution is that the, um, you know, the areas that are permeable have sort of like open fractures, things are connected, uh, there's not a lot of secondary um, mineralization. Uh, there are also those, those pockets of, um, 
of kerogen, organic matter, uh, tend to not bind well with the rest of the materials there. So there are basically um, gaps around them, you know, that allow gas to flow. Regions that um, are like impermeable to gas, you know, they're, they're, are, they're, they're lower porosity, uh, they're full of, you know, minerals that have deposited, they're clay rich, um, kind of the things that you would expect from, you know, a, a sandstone uh, that was low, per low permeability. So um, I want to take you down in scale. Uh, we've done a fair amount of transmission electron microscopy uh, because that really had, well, for two reasons. That has the resolution to see nanopores. Uh, and we can also, as this is showing here, what you do is you basically you thin down a piece of shale to about 100 nanometers thick. Uh, and it's still, you know, microns wide and microns long. Uh, this can go in a transmission electron microscope. And you can rotate the stage. So you can rotate it about 60 degrees each way. Uh, and then you have enough views where we can do computed tomography, just like we're doing uh, with, uh, with the, you know, with the x-rays. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, uh, yeah, it's a way to get 3D information, I guess, out of a 2D measurement. Um, so uh, we can do like a, a lot of our standard uh, image processing, a lot of our standard uh, computed tomography. Uh, we'll look at this, this particular region. So there is a, a basically an impermeable quartz grain on each side of this. There is some nanoporous organic matter in between. Uh, so here is a 3D reconstruction of what it looks like. And here's actually even a zoomed in uh, area here, right? So uh, the voxel size is um, less than, well, it's about five nanometers uh, on a side. So you can reliably see things sort of on that, on that scale. We can't see smaller than that. Um, so, you know, there's a, this, so it's a small but very rich um, data set. Uh, we can kind of zoom in and look at what the pores look like. And I've got a, a, a table in just a moment that kind of characterizes some of what these things look like. But they're interesting because the, the, the pores that look connected are sort of these tubular, angular kind of pores. There are all kinds of pore shapes, but these are sort of the the connected pore shapes. So with that sort of like image of pore shape, we can uh, do digital rock physics on it and basically like compute uh, permeability, understand where fluids are flowing, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, different ranges in the parameter space that are interesting. Uh, and the other sort of nice thing about TEM is that your upscaling technique is uh, is as, you know FIB SEM right? So you can uh, s you know take an image or take a sample for TEM in one place, then go back in and do and take a, an FIB SEM sample which is bigger. And so there's a way to both have a, a volume uh, that's small scale and a volume that's larger, uh, and which you can do both you know image processing and digital rock physics on on both of the same, uh, the same images. So the FBI BSCM resolution is a little bit less, but uh, it, it sort of works, works pretty well. So what it basically, you know, the, the kind of the story here is that um, if you've ever seen images of shale and people go in and they, they, they really dwell on the small nanopores, yes, these samples are full of these very small um, nanopores, but they're, they're not connected. Okay, so um, the, you know, in terms of their contribution to transport, it's really the larger scale features and how those larger scale features are then connected into like micro cracks and fractures, right? That are important, and then how those respond to stress is is super important, right? So this is why this you know this is it's a cap rock integrity is a complicated thing because it's you know it's multi scale and multi physics. Um, and it's, it's really hard to, to actually wrap your arms around what information you really need to know in order to, to um, say things about, about permeability that are sort of like universal. Okay, so um, in terms of 
terms of things, I want to move on to effective diffusivity. Uh, you know, professors are programmed to talk like 60 minutes, right? So th this is, this is the, the, the tough thing. So I'll just show you a little bit of effective diffusivity, and then I'll, I'll probably skip and show you a little bit about slip and... Actually, I'm not going to tell you anything about slip and friction, but I'm going to tell you about permeability after uh, a, f a fracture is slipped. So... Um, yeah, 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 no, I want only some time for discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've, I could definitely take even more than, more than five minutes. So um, uh, we saw earlier how important diffusivity is, right? So uh, if, it's, if it's gas saturated, if it's liquid saturated, that difference matters. Uh, the value of diffusivity matters. What the effective diffusivity is, uh, is important. So we've been measuring uh, are trying to measure, is what this story is about, effective diffusivity in, in shale samples um, to, to really understand, you know, transport. And so, the, you know, this is a complicated diagram, but here's the, here's the, the, basically the experiment. So there's a sample here. It's basically closed on all sides, and we, f and, and it's, it's de uh, decane and iododecane. Uh, so iododecane is uh, C12, with an iodine molecule on it, which is very uh, X-ray absorptive, so we can actually use it as a tracer. And then we flow that, we just flow it on this face, and then we can watch uh, the fluid diffuse in. Okay, so uh, these are uh, images of iodeca iododecane diffusing in. So blue is the original decane saturation, and then the, the more red it is, is where the tracer is going. So what's, I, I think, and so this is on a, you know, a shale that we have characterized. Um, I think when most people think about diffusion in porous media, you think of some sort of uniform diffusion front moving in that follows that, you know, complementary air function solution. Um, and that does happen in like sandstones. We've done this experiment in sandstones and that is what it looks like. Here, that, that local fabric is really determinative of where uh, things flow initial or diffuse initially. And if you, do, if you look at this face here and look at this region up on the sort of the upper left, you can see that it goes into this more permeable feature. And then you can see it, it is diffusing into matrix, right? So that matrix is getting you know, is, is diffusing in, but it's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a process that's very much determined by the, the fabric of the rock. Nevertheless, people are going to, you know, are going to know, not, you know, people are going to measure diffusivity this way. They're not going to image it. They're going to say it's just like a 1D process, um, and they're going to do stuff like this. So this is the same data. Um, uh, done a little more, you know, like a traditional way. Although, uh, if you look here at the boundary, we've got a, a well, we've got a, a boundary condition that's changing in time. This has been one of the problems with this experiment, is getting the, the face sort of fully saturated. Um, and then these are at, you know, these are concentration versus time at a particular position, and, you know, things are, you know, diffusing in nicely. So, uh, in terms of, you know, kind of numbers here, uh, you see, you know, effective diffusivity on the order of 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second, and then uh, iododecane and decane uh, just in bulk would be about 10 to the minus 9, so it is diffusing more slowly, as you'd expect. Again, it's liquid saturated, so it's about four orders of magnitude slower than, uh, than gas saturated, right? And um, what we're trying to do here is really connect up... Uh, you know, really the diffusion response back to that, what the, what the fabric looks like. Okay, so I we promised I'm just going to do this. So, you know, these adsorb, okay, they're super reactive. Uh, we've been doing um, basically flow through reactive uh, experiments and that same idea of going back and acquiring uh, SEMs at particular places that look interesting and, uh, you know, and then connecting that up to effluent data. It's interesting, uh, permeability uh, always goes, almost always goes down in experiments, which would mean uh, that we can probably go in and treat seals to make them more sealing 
if we just used our knowledge of chemistry. So uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just kind of ooh we got yeah, to pull all these in. Um, so I'll just kind of end up here. This is another kind of interesting thing that we've been working on. And play with the place to start is here in the uh, upper right. So again, this is you know core sized um, uh, core sized sample like uh, inch diameter, couple inches long. Uh, there's a fracture here in the middle. These are also imaged, so I'm not going to show you any images. Um, we, um, and, and I, I should also tell you that the, the holder is, uh, allows sort of true triaxial conditions, right? So we cause slip on that fracture, so this is the holder here. Uh, and then we can look at the permeability of the, of the system. So, you know, one of the things that we do is we look at, uh, you know, behavior like permeability and it's vacuum saturated. Uh, again, we will look at when it's krypton saturated. Uh, and then in these cases, we flowed supercritical um, CO2 in. Okay, and we can, you know, look how things behave. And on the bottom right, uh, we have a bunch of uh, samples with a, a lot of different compositions. So composition does matter um, a little bit. So what's, oh, I'm gonna pull all these in. I didn't realize that they had a little bit of animation there. And there's one more, no, I, that doesn't have that. So um, this would be just slip. So the CO2 has some other effects, right? It adsorbs as, as I sort of showed you. And what's, what's pretty interesting here um, is if you look uh, in this part here and this line uh, is basically the initial permeability. So some of these samples, you know, you would think that slip on the fracture would then make that fracture be more permeable. Two of the samples actually become less permeable. So the displacement has actually made them uh, be, in the experiment, be more sealing. Uh, we can, sorry, these were somewhat animated. Uh, we can we did this again with with CO2 and again there's a lot of information here, uh, but uh, on again the bottom right is really the thing to look at and one would be again the original permeability. So these samples ha with CO2 have all um, decreased in permeability, right? So the this, the combination of the CO2 adsorption, the CO2 itself, and the slip has actually made that fracture uh, be more sealing than it was uh, originally. So I'm going to stop there. So that's, you know, sort of the summary, right? You know, they, these cap rocks are multi-scale, multi-physics. Um, you know, you forget one of the physical or chemical processes uh, sort of at your own uh, danger, right? You really need to think about how these things all sort of come together. Um, I hope you enjoyed seeing images, right? Because my group has put a huge amount of work into figuring out how to image things that people said you couldn't image. Um, and uh, you know, this 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 story on slip is uh, evolving, and it's uh, I think pretty interesting. So those are the references. These are my acknowledgments. Uh, importantly, here you know you see a long list of contributors, one of whom is sitting here, Yu Hong. Uh, so um, I you know. This would not have been as much data without, actually been no data without any of them. So <laughs> I'm going to so stop. Much. Yep. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> and you were perfectly in time. I mean, you left quite a long time for discussion. So well, because I, yeah. <laughs> you skipped some, but thanks. Uh, uh, Bart has, uh, maybe behind you to start, and then a Bart. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Heim van Gens, State Supervision of Mines. Um, so thanks for the talk. As a geologist, I'm always very glad with people showing rocks being heterogeneous, heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, um, uh, you showed also that there's a lot of gas in the seal, and they are chemically active, and uh, there's a lot of organic matter. And we also saw today a talk about microbes. Do you care to speculate <laughs> <laughs> what kind of effect microbes could have on the sealing integrity of, uh, of, of, of these seals once they get introduced? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I just said, you know, we neglect things that are our own, uh, you know, danger, but I think speculating something, I don't, I, I, I don't know. That is one of the questions that we want to ask uh, in these samples. Do, 
especially with hydrogen, right, as to what, what's going to happen, what's going to evolve, um, what products are going to be are going to be there. Um, and just to clarify too, I'm not necessarily saying that seals have gas in them. I'm saying uh, what we've looked at in the laboratory, and again, this this sort of finger painting calculation sort of suggests that if there's any permeability in the sh in the seal, um, there should be some gas up there because it's going to try and equilibrate with with uh, you know the storage formation. So that, that was one of the questions that I had. So uh, indeed, uh, microbes uh, do they contribute? But uh, also, if you take it further, let's say if such an event happens, right? Are, are there thoughts on mitigation strategies? Because if you have natural attenuation, let's say microbes could do the thing, but you need a little bit of water activity in, in a seal in that case. If it's fully gas filled, I don't think it will happen. So you need a water saturation, certain water saturation at least. I'm curious for your thoughts on what can you do if something like or loss of integrity of a seal happens? Are there measures to be taken? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I, you know, so this all depends on how well you can access where the problem is. Um, but, you know, the, these shale, yeah, so if, it's, if it has a problem, it must have some permeability, right? You know, that it's going to be there. So you sh if you can get something there to deliver a fluid, uh, well, yeah, but, but you know, you, you think about where it can come from. So, you know, we could draw definitely a way to get to a leak. You know, the question is how expensive it would be. But yeah, we know, we know from, from, you know, the oil industry from years of making scale that they didn't want to make, um, you know, we know how to, what to, you know, what to put in there in order to kind of close these things down. And with, you know, the surprising thing is you think these are impermeable, that, you know, reaction rates are very long and slow, but there's so much surface area um, you know that that these sort of these you know these lab experiments that I went through um, are you know order weeks, um, but you know depending on the sample I should have gone back the hard way right. Anyways, we're going to do this the hard way because that's how I like to do things. Um, if we look here on the right. Uh, that bar on the right are, is porosity reduction over, you know, experimental time scale. And the smallest number there is about 50% permeability reduction, sorry, right? So under, you know, lab time scales, the sample, which is under stress uh, and has a non-equilibrated fluid going in it, um, which is not complicated at all. It's, it's just a brine. There's nothing, you know, it loses half of its permeability. Um, so... You know, getting to those things is going to be difficult, but I think we know. I mean, I think there's enough knowledge cumulatively out there, right, that we could, we could actually, you know, mitigate seals if, if you know, you know, if we can make this chemistry work, which I think we can. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, Maya from TU Eindhoven speaking. Um, I wanted to ask a question about one of the properties we haven't talked about so far, um, with hydrogen of hydrogen being its small kinetic diameter. So it's being the smallest molecule which we're working with basically in the subsurface. Do you have any comments or thoughts about what it means for, for it, um, for, for, for the ceiling of a cap rock? So in terms of, we know that it's diffusing even through intercrystalline structures. We know in, in pipes it's causing hydrogen embitterment. What does it mean for the cap rock? Yeah, so, um, so you know, it's small. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about methane is methane does not swell clays. Uh, there are, are, are some initial measurements people have made that suggest that hydrogen will actually, in clays, it'll swell, can make them swell. Uh, it definitely will absorb, absorb into the organic matter if there's organic matter there. Um, those two properties are probably good for the cap rock, right, because it's going to basically, you know, seal things up. Um, you know, on the downside, I, I didn't show this, but um, a lot of people keep talking about a cushion gas, and I think the assumption is there it's some gas that's not hydrogen. Um, that small molecular diameter, I, again, you can just do diffusion times, right? So 
you would think that hydrogen's gonna tend to rise buoyantly, but it's also, it wants to diffuse downward as well, right? So it's like its own really good mixer. Um, so it, it, it's, it, yeah, I think your point's well taken. There's a lot, you know, and I hope this is the thing that people get from this, is there's really a lot to think about with hydrogen uh, beneath a cap rock because, um, uh, you know, I, I think we know the questions to ask, and I think we have the laboratory ability to ask those questions. I think we have the computational ability to ask those questions. We need to ask those questions um, so that we, you know, we, we really can tell a complete story. Um, yeah. Yeah. To, actually, my question is right along the same line uh, as the last two. Um, so, you know, uh, methane's an absorbing gas, CO2 is an absorbing gas, hydrogen is probably not an absorbing gas, but if I you. I think it does absorb. You, you think it does? Yeah. So, would that, all these processes, the methane, you know, the, and, and the desorption isotherm is very steep at very, very low pressures yeah. and, and, and pretty flat. Yeah, the history. So, if you don't yeah. take a, you know, uh, a depleted gas reservoir to too low a pressure, there should still be a lot of adsorbed gas, right, in the cap rock which would really help the seal quite a bit. So it seems to me like they're almost going to be, there's sort of a natural mitigation going on. And I was just wondering if there's any way to, to simulate that, you know, in the lab by, you know, first introducing a, an absorbing gas and then introducing a non-absorbing gas and, and seeing what happens. Yeah, well, I mean, we could, you could, I mean, a, a, a great way to do that would just be a permeability measurement, right? So saturate with, what you think the original gas is, and then come in with the other one, and then just measure, well, it's a little bit hard, it's hard, well, if you're measuring what's originally there, it's easier, because it's hard to measure hydrogen. Um, but then just measure the elution curve, right, and then you'll, you'll know permeability and, you know, how much is there, yeah. I have a follow-up, Hamid, go, yeah. and then I go. Did I keep you awake? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't check in, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just want to follow up still on the microbial part, just to check. Eh? If you do the experiments, you don't necessarily have measures to really are sure that no microbial growth within your experiments happening, right? Uh, how would we know if microbial growth occurred? Is the well, we would look. We I, I would look for products. I mean, sorry? we we could look for products, right? Yeah, yeah. but yeah. you, I mean, you don't take measures like sterilization or things like that to really prevent microbial growth from taking place. I know that people, when they look in polymers and surfactants, they do think that they work in an abiotic system, but actually, in many cases, they don't. So. I'm just wondering yeah, the, whether you the, took the, measures to avoid microbial growth. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, this is a, we don't. Yeah, we we wouldn't necessarily no. inject like a biocide before no. we do an okay. experiment or anything. We would. Yeah, and in fact, a lot of these experiments actually were, all, were dried first. Everything that you saw, I think, uh, but sometimes we do with the original fluids. Yeah, and we we do look for you know products from. But but yeah, we we don't have any way of definitively knowing. Also, that if we went longer as well, that it might have just been that, you know, the products are at such low concentration that we didn't detect them. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding the last experiments you showed uh, for permeability reduction for the slip fracture. Uh, what What do you think the reason for reducing uh, uh, permeability is that the roughness is uh, reduced by dissolution due to CO two in the place or something else? Uh, yeah, so it's a pretty smooth, I mean, it's a saw cut fracture. Uh, and when it slips, probably even the little bit of asperities are getting knocked off, right? And so then that material is now coating the fracture, right? So it's, it's basically the, you know, the fine material that's broken off has, is basically plugging up the fracture, I think would be a big part of it. And then with the CO2, the CO2 does absorb, right? So it's, it's, it's doing what we'd normally expect in a core. Uh, so I think that's what's, that's what's going on, yeah. So the gouge part, yeah. Yeah, and the, we have online questions, Tony, as well. Uh, so uh, a colleague's asking, uh, how do you make these nanoscale images? It's quite impressive, and then it's very delicate also to do that. Uh, is there any kind of share of knowledge and experience you want to, to have for the community? Yeah, this is, well, I would say thank you for this question because, you know, I showed that stuff quickly 
And that was two years of work for somebody whose name is Laura. Um, <laughs> And she got the PhD or? She's almost done. Yeah, she's almost finished. Yeah, so I mean, that's a very delicate. Well, so the, the most frustrating thing is you, do, you, you make these lamella, so you thin them down. Um, and if you don't hold on to them well, you put them into like the next machine, which is a vacuum. You know, the first part is it's a vacuum extraction. And then you can lose what you just made because the vacuum oh. pulls it off. Um, but basically, what we do is we have a sample. Uh, we would do some preliminary look at it, probably under an, uh, well, not probably, under an SEM, uh, and choose an area that we think looks promising for whatever we, th we want to look at. So in, in those experiments, we wanted to look at nanoporosity. Uh, and so with the focused ion beam on an FIB SEM, basically you blast off the material um, and so you remove it. You have to be careful not to remove it too fast because if you remove it too fast, the sample gets hot and then you create features that you didn't want to see. Um, yeah. So that it's a slow process. It can, yeah, it's about a day to, wow. to make one of those. Uh, and then you grab onto it very, very well. Um, and, and that often involves a lot of platinum uh, because the probe that comes in, you use platinum to hold it. So... Uh, we use a lot of that, yeah, and then you pull it out, uh, and then from there it's almost <coughs> almost standard transmission electron microscopy. Uh, the tilt stuff, you have to be a little bit careful because those machines um, will say they're going a degree, but it might be, or less than a degree, whatever you put in. Say you put in a half a degree, and you think it's exactly half a degree, but it could be 0.55, right? So you have to do some work, some QA in the in the base images. But then once you have those, uh, it's a standard tomographic reconstruction, right? So you can use standard you software. You make sure to tell Nora that she should be proud of what she has done. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> not only Just that, I thank her. Advisor. I thank her often for <laughs> what she's done. Yes. There is also another question about the mechanism behind this uh, permeability reduction. Uh, is it due to swelling, my C2, or something, some mechanism that would go, what would be your your suggestion about the process that goes to do this permeability reduction. Yeah, so I've, show, I've shown you two permeability reductions. So with, with gases, uh, you know, the pore spaces are tight. So when they adsorb, you know, the adsorbed layer really doesn't move very well, right? So it adsorbs, uh, it's bound to the surface. You know, it, it will, you know, people will show you MD simulations of mm -hmm you know, adsorbed layers moving, so they probably are moving, right? But largely, because it's nanoporous, you're blocking up the pore space with this mostly immobile fluid, and that's reducing permeability. There are some materials that also will swell, right? So mm -hmm. the kerogen will swell, mm -hmm. uh, and that's like an internal compression process, so it also closes down. In, you know, in these experiments that are up here, these are all uh, actually done under dissolving conditions. So the system is set up to be dissolving. So it, the material is being dissolved, but some things are also being precipitated. Uh, and importantly, they're under stress, right? So um, people think, oh, I dissolve something, I leave a cavern, but you know, it's being pushed on by a lot of pressure, right? So you create a void space and the confining just closes it up. So those are the two main mechanisms that we and have looked at. The last question I have uh, among the many is, is about different rocks, if we want to do those kind of very uh, high precision imaging. Would those work for, for example, carbonates or other processes that you would like to understand in porous material? Um, uh, yes, yeah. And all the PhD students. Uh, well, in fact, I, I, I'll tell you, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's just a little interesting story. So one of the students who did a really a lot of work here is a man named Hamza Al-Jaman. Uh, and he went back to work for Saudi Aramco, uh, and they put him on a gas storage project, right? So they, the, in Saudi Arabia, uh, they have peak gas demand in the summer, uh, and so they wanted to be able to store gas. And basically, he just repeated this workflow and, and, and did you know, all of the other things that you need to do to develop a gas storage project. So yeah, so it's the same, much of the same workflow. A final question, uh, then we move on. Hi, Seoka from uh, EVN. Um, what is, according to your research, um, the best cap rock, rock type 
we can use for hydrogen storage? Uh, that's a good Indu question. Industry, look into the... Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this may, this may change, but, you know, you would really, I think you'd want a rock that um, is low porosity, has a small occurrence of fractures with something you can measure. Um, something that's, that's hard to fracture would be good, so something very ductile. Um, would, would so very very clay rich might be might be good. Um, I don't know, Mark. I can throw that to you too. I would, I would agree. Uh, really, more clay rich probably better. Yeah. The more clay. Increased ductility. Yeah. 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 Yeah.